Okay, great. Um, so I was originally um, here to uh, give a talk specifically about um, what was called maximally verifying like clients and sharding, and I will end up touching on um, a lot of that um, in this talk in certain ways, but I also wanted to make it broader a bit and basically make it be not just about scalability and just about sharding, but also a kind of general outline at a proposal for what I think a sensible path for Ethereum protocol development in general to be going forward over maybe the next two to four years or so, right? So I'll, and I'll start off by yeah, just let's take a look at what's been going on in Ethereum so far, right? So in Ethereum, we've uh, first of all had a lot of successes. So first of all, the Ethereum blockchain and Ethereum protocol work. Um, work. <laughs> Um, you may have noted the, uh, the, the total lack of a crippling DDoS attack on the network this year. Um. <laughs> Many applications, and you know, we've gone to somewhere o uh, over a thousand applications at this point, and I'm pretty sure people aren't even really counting anymore. Um, and, you know, it shows in all the charts, right? So this is the Ethereum transaction chart, and uh, we just recently broke above 500,000 uh, transactions per day for the first time, which, um, in case you can't divide, um, is uh, something like uh, over seven transactions per second. And so it's, um, well, it's uh, or almost exactly seven transactions per second at the peak, actually. So you know, the scale, the amount of activity on the Ethereum blockchain is, orders of magnitude higher than it was you know, like one or two years ago. And this includes not just Ether transfers, it includes ERC-20s, it includes Ether Delta, it includes various diff different dApps, you know, it, just, it includes you know, just a whole bunch of different smart contracts of various types. Um, this is another um, diagram I'm fairly proud of. This is the global Ethereum network with you know, more than 20,000 nodes worldwide with um, hubs existing all over North America, including East Coast and West Coast, um, hubs all over Europe, uh, a bunch in Russia, um, a smaller but still very significant and growing um, amount uh, scattered across the various hubs in Asia, and you know, like increasingly um, kind of, you know, n nodes starting to show up in places like South, uh, South America and Africa as well. Um, According to the data that got scraped from either this site or another site a couple of days ago, we seem to have one node in North Korea, but not sure if that's actually in North Korea. Um, yeah, so in general, no, of, of a lot of progress, right? And if you look at just Byzantium as well, you know, the Byzantium hard fork basically you know, has gone through, and you can now, take advantage of uh, cryptographic uh, primitives that are available in an accelerated form on top of the Ethereum blockchain in order to build privacy-preserving applications. And people already are. So, you know, you just saw Zocrates in the last presentation. Just yesterday, I saw on Reddit someone announced uh, uh, a protocol that was doing a reputation market uh, based on ZK Snarks. You know, like there's... Um, I know of you know, like one project uh, that's uh, trying to do things uh, w uh, with ring signatures, actually multiple projects. So I also know of at least a couple of projects that are taking advantage of RSA verification to do things like better communicate between Ethereum and existing uh, DNS, um, between you know, like Estonian e-residency and just various other things. So the privacy part of the three kind of major challenges to Ethereum success that I've outlined, privacy, security, and scalability, is actually quite well on the way to being solved. Now, there is still a lot of work to be done. Someone actually has to build the ring signature stuff. Someone actually has to build Socrates. People actually have to use it. People have to actually make using zero knowledge proofs practical, but we've made progress. So what are the challenges? So scalability is probably challenge number one, right? So um, in this is a quick excerpt from the sharding FAQ where I talk about this challenge called the, the scalability trilemma. And I basically state that you know, it seems likely that blockchain systems can only have at most two of these three properties at the same time. Number one, decentralization, um, which I define as basically 
being able to run without trusting super nodes, scalability, so being able to process many more transactions than a regular laptop, and security, so basically, you know, it's okay to be vulnerable to 51% attacks, but you definitely cannot be vulnerable to 0.51% attacks. There is a very, very big and growing graveyard of systems that claim to solve the scalability triangle, but actually completely don't. So, I mean, like, I actually think that the scalability triangle is solvable, but it basically requires significantly more kind of complex technologies than, you know, the kinds of technologies that we have available. Part of this is something called the data availability problem, which it's, I'm not going to talk about today because, you know, really does require a one-hour presentation to go through. But basically, you know, it gets this problem that, uh, Look, a lot of people don't even think about, but basically, not only do you need to verify that the blockchain is valid, you also need to verify that everyone can access the blockchain. And even ZK Snarks and Starks cannot solve that part of the puzzle. And there's mathematical proofs based on information theory that say that if you cannot solve that part of the puzzle, your protocol is basically, you know, is basically cannot be secure. Um, the relevant paper here is um, one, basically one that says that batch updates for cryptographic accumulators are impossible. And so I'm um, a hat tip to Justin Drake for that one. So it's a, it is a very significant and hard challenge. So basically right now, every node processes every transaction. The capacity of a blockchain is limited to the capacity of one node. And it's actually even worse because we need to have safety margins for anti-DDoS purposes. Um, the limiting factor in Ethereum scalability and Ethereum's likely worst point of DDoS vulnerability is likely to be discrete. And also Ethereum uh, VM execution is currently absolutely not parallelizable. So, you know, these are just known facts and they you know, severely limit the extents to which Ethereum in its present form can scale. So the likely solution to a lot of this, now there are more incremental solutions that we can do. So for example, you can use um, EIP-648 to greatly improve parallelizability. But if you want to really solve the fundamental problem, every node processes every transaction, basically sharding. And the way that you think about sharding is, well, basically you can split the blockchain state so split the set of information that everyone needs to keep track of into n universes. And we call each one of these universes a shard. Right? So each universe has its own account space, its own accounts, its own contracts. Uh, tr you can have transactions within each shard. And you only allow asynchronous communication between shards. So if you want to send a, a, a coin from shard A to shard B, you actually have to have two transactions, the first transaction on shard A and the second uh, transaction on shard B. And contracts on shard A cannot synchronously call contracts on shard B. So you cannot call a contract on shard B and get a response and do something with that response in one transaction. Um, and the benefit of all this is that each client only processes a small portion of all the activity on the network. So the reason why we call it quadratic sharding is because if you imagine, you know, the processing capacity of one computer to be n, then you can imagine n shards, and each shard has, you know, like n worth of activity. Each node would have to st would have to process the activity on basically just the one shard it's interested in, and every node would have to process the activity of kind of the entire system of shards. So the amount of activity of each node would basically be n at the top and n at the bottom, so a total of 2n, but the capacity of the entire system would be n squared. And theoretically, you can make the sharding be exponential, but you know, a quadratic is simpler, and you know, there might be good reasons to keep it quadratic. And it may well be a reasonable approach to say, you know, look, we only do sharding up to quadratic, and if you want to go up to exponential, then basically you have to stick with things like sharding in plasma, or sorry, uh, state channels in plasma. Um, another challenge that we've had is this kind of challenge of governance and protocol evolution. So basically, you know, we have this trade-off where, on the one hand, we want progress, but on the other hand, you know, there is demand for protocol stability. And hard forks making deep changes are hard, right? So we finally gotten Byzantium out on October 16th, and Byzantium is the result of, you know, like over a year of work, a large amount of testing, and, you know, like even after a year of testing, we still required some pretty epic work between, you know, like the Go team and the Parity team doing, you know, like super advanced forms of fuzz testing that even that I don't even fully understand in order to catch, you know, like a, 
a, a fairly lar a large number of bugs that, that appeared pretty close to launch. So hard forks making deep changes take a long time to code, take a long time to agree on, a long time to test, and there is a high risk of consensus bugs, especially since the Ethereum pro uh, network has like basically seven different uh, clients that you have to, uh, that all have to implement the protocol and agree on it. But even still, even with all these challenges, you know, we've done by Zantam and we've done it successfully. So, to, but the problem is, right, that on the one hand, hard forks making deep changes are hard. On the other hand, to get to what we want to see in Ethereum 2.0, so to get to this kind of highly sharded, highly scalable network, as well as all of the EVM upgrades we want to do, all of the parallelizability upgrades we want to do, EVM 1.5, eWASM, potentially more pre-compiles, in order to get to this ideal end state, very deep changes are exactly what we need. So what do we do? How do we handle the trade-off? So intuition, one blockchain, two systems. And I'll make this clear with uh, the uh, kind of diagram that I'll show in the next slide. So here is you know, like what a sharding system as we're st already starting to build my, uh, as, uh, could possibly look like. Right? So you have the main chain. And in the main chain, you know, it's basically, uh, everything is basically as it was before. You have your blocks, you have your state route, you have your transaction route, you have your state, you have your accounts, your contracts, your storage. Now, what we're going to do is in the main chain, we're going to add something or a called a validator manager contract. Now, what does the validator manager contract do? It basically runs a proof of stake system that maintains the consensus for a kind of two-layer sharding system that exists kind of on top of or even inside uh, the main chain in a certain sense. So the validator manager contract would keep track of validators and would allow anyone to join and leave the system, serve as a validator, and basically assign the right to create blocks on like, um, in each of these end shards that the validator manager contract keeps track of. The VMC would also keep track of block headers for each of these shards. Um, but, and, but what the VMC would not do is it would not verify the full blocks of the shard. And the VMC would not contain a copy of all the new consensus rules. Instead, basically, actually creating valid blocks, actually enforcing that the blocks are valid in the shards, actually enforcing that the data in the shards um, is, uh, it, it is entirely available and follows the desired consensus rules, basically is the, would be the responsibility of the proof of stake that exists inside the validator manager contract. So the validator manager contract would initially be this kind of very low risk thing to participate in. There would actually not be a ri not even be a risk of total slashing in the same way that there is in Casper. And the, the the goal would be to basically just get you know like a fairly significant portion of Ether stake participating in this. And like basically, if you are part of the validator manager contract, then you just get assigned randomly the right to create blocks in each and every one of these shards at periodic intervals. Um, I should probably use more correct terminology. We, we call the blocks inside of shards collations. So if you have a transaction, then transactions get grouped into collations, and the collation headers then get put into the valid validator manager contract, and they get put into transactions that get, get included into blocks. So we have this kind of two-layer structure where at the top layer you would have the blockchain, and you, at the bottom layer, you would have all of these different shards, and each shard would be like its own universe. And connecting the two universes, you have this validator manager contract, which enforces the proof of stake, basically maintains a built in internal light client for each of the shards, and uh, uh, processes and facilitates things like, you know, like moving ether from the, main sh from the main chain to the shards, and possibly from one shard to the other. So you can think of the kind of differences between, you know, like the two systems, between the main shard world and the new shard world, so if, uh, somewhat like this, right? So scalability, so main shard is O of C. So C is the letter I normally use to refer to the computational capacity of one node. So the main shard would have a scalability of just O of C, which is exactly what it does now. And the new shards would have a capacity of O of C squared. And the reason for this is you have O of C shards, and each of the O of C shards itself has O of C capacity. Right? So um, by the way, if you're not familiar with big O notation, just like don't think about the O's. Main chain scalability of C, new shard scalability of C squared, because there's C shards, and each shard has C transactions per block. 
consensus algorithm. So on the main chart, the consensus algorithm is currently proof of work. Um, in the very sh you know, short to medium term, we hope to transition it um, into hybrid proof of stake in the form of a Casper a friendly finality gadget, um, a, paper, a paper for which was released on archive uh, something like five days ago, and which is actually, I would say, nearing the kind of final stages of uh, full specification. And eventually, we would uh, transition the main chain consensus into full proof of stake. Now, the consensus switch itself is designed to be fairly conservative, and so, and, possible to implement in this kind of fairly slow and careful way, right? So for example, the first part of the switch to hybrid proof of stake actually doesn't require a hard fork. Technically, it does, I mean, it requires this weird kind of soft fork where basically it's not even like a real soft fork. Instead, it's just an optional change to the fork choice rule that's used inside of a client. The only thing you would need a hard fork for is when we want to basically stop providing rewards to proof of work miners, or at least reduce the rewards to proof of work miners and switch the rewards to validators. So the switch to proof of stake, I'm fairly confident, can be done in this kind of gradual, fairly conservative way. Um, main shard has full security, basically the same security guarantees we can expect to have now. And the governance of the main shard, basically in order to kind of satisfy the demand of people that really want to have like basically stronger, uh, stronger immutability and less risk on the main chain, we can, ha you know, we can have norms of governance that emphasize conservatism and strong immutability more than today. Now, what happens in the new shards? So scalability O of C squared, um, consensus, is this proof of stake where in order to vote in the proof of stake, you would have to deposit ether into the validator manager contract and the validator manager contract would randomly assign to you the right to create blocks on all of these shards. The security would be 50% honest majority of the on-chain proof of stakeholders now. And basically once the, uh, sh like, what we want to do with Ethereum 2.0 and sharding solidify enough, then you know, like eventually, it would, the shards would be kind of tightly coupled and the two would have roughly the same level of security. And now the governance uh, for the new shards is basically just going to be on-chain ether voting, right? So basically for these new shards, because you have this proof of stake, we might as well have this proof of stake be, uh, be used in order to like basically vote on what the protocol changes are within this sharded universe, right? So basically, you know, like validators themselves already are, are going to be the ones that enforce the consensus rules. So, you know, like, why not just have them be, you know, just the one, I mean, they kind of are the ones that, that, that decide on the rules already, so we might as well accept this. And we basically actually take advantage of this because this kind of on-chain uh, ETH voting governance would give us the ability to basically emphasize fast evolution in the new shards initially. And then when we have this tight coupling and when every client becomes basically a fully validating client for all the shards, then you know, the, gov the kind of governance would become much more conservative. So this is kind of the, the dichotomy that I'm suggesting, where we can have these two universes at the same time, where the universe on the left, the main shard, is just basically continues working as Ethereum. We do not need to negotiate EVM 1.5, negotiate eWASM between seven different Ethereum implementations. And we can focus on relatively milder things that do things like state size control, that do things uh, like um, you know, just improving security, possibly, possibly improving parallelizability a bit, heavy focus on the proof of stake switch. And we have this other new universe, or really these new N universes in which like basically the uh, implementation of you know, like all of these things that we've already been working on over the last one to two years can basically be rolled out onto the main net like much, much faster. So here's what an implementation roadmap might look like, right? So sharding road, basically step one is you would implement this kind of sharding universe as a proof of stake sidechain. And you know, in a proof of stake sidechain, in each shard, you would have collations, and the collation headers would be verified and processed by this on main chain validator manager contract. Block creation rights are assigned by a simple proof of stake in the VMC. Um, clients would just get randomly assigned the right to create blocks and randomly shuffled between shards. And in the first step, you could have one way ETH convertibility. In the second stage, you could make the ETH convertibility two way. Now, this is what a node for the Ethereum sharded network might look like. 
right? So you already have the existing Ethereum nodes that talk to the existing Ethereum network. Everything on the left does not need to be changed one single bit. What you have on the right is you could have a sharded chain node. Sharded chain nodes would be responsible for basically broadcasting full collations, right? So collation headers would go into the validator manager contract. Full collations would only be broadcasted in this sharded chain network um, between all of the nodes that are participating in the sharding system. So sharded chain node would be written in Python initially, and it could be designed in such a way that it can talk to any Ethereum node by RPC. Now, if we want fast evolution, we could have like basically one or two clients for the for the sharded chain node initially, and then over time, you know, like ramp it up to the full seven as some more teams become ready. So, you know, basically, you would have this kind of fairly you know, kind of partial split between what happens on the Ethereum side and what happens in these uh, in these sharded networks, where you know, basically, you would really have a shard network for like basically every single shard, right? So. After this, you would add two-way convertibility. You would move the collation headers from the VMC into, let's say, being main chain Ethereum uncles. And then the step four would be tight coupling. So tight coupling basically means if you have a block in the main, uh, a uh, block in the main chain that contains a collation header which is invalid, then the entire main chain block is invalid. So invalidity on the sh on the shard side will be able to cause invalidity on the main chain side. And this would be basically when the main chain and the shards would both switch into this kind of tighter, secure, uh, uh, tighter security mode. And stage four is something that you know, theoretically could happen later. Ideally, it should happen basically when things on the sharding side are actually reasonably stabilized. So remember, the shards that I'm suggesting are creating new address space. They are not affecting existing address space. This gives us a unique opportunity to make many very important, many efficiency improving, but backwards incompatible changes to the Ethereum protocol. So what kind of changes do we want to make? Well, we can just list through a few, right? So number one, changing Merkle trees from hexary trees to binary trees. This is a no-brainer. It makes the Merkle proofs four times shorter. Um, account state tree redesigns. So you might want to get rid of contract storage trees. You might want to have like multi-level nested trees. You might want to have a different account system. You know, we, there, these are things that we can brainstorm. These are things that you know like we can think about and optimize. Um, EVM upgrades. So basically, you know, can we make the EVM efficient enough that pre-compiles are no longer necessary? It seems like it's very, it's very likely that we can. So in the Ethereum community, we have had these kind of two paths for um, optimizing the EVM, where one of them is the second kind of Greg Colvin's approach of EVM 1.5, which is more moderate um, upgrades and additions to the existing EVM. And the second one is this kind of full-scale replacement with eWASM. Well, basically, the idea would be let's work together, let's come up with you know, like what, mo what combination of these two models seems most reasonable, and let's just immediately apply it as the only EVM available in the shards. And so this way, you know, like you'd have much more efficiency without having to worry about as many backwards compatibility issues. Um, parallelizability. So there are fairly simple Ethereum upgrades that we can do. So EIP 648 is one example. There's also a sharding EIP, which is a stricter version of EIP 648, which basically lets you execute Ethereum transactions in parallel. If you can do that, then we basically have, you know, like if we really, if we want it kind of unlimited access to the kind of big block scaling route, right? So if we, if we have parallelizability, if we want to, we could always make the blocks bigger, and all that would happen is that the kind of resource requirements of running a node would just be a bit higher, but if you have enough cores, you would still be able to process a block fairly quickly. So par uh, parallelizability is something that if we tried to add it to the existing Ethereum, I mean, it would require some fairly deep changes, but if we can make this kind of new system where we have parallelizability right from the start, then it might be easier. Stateless clients. <coughs> so stateless clients are a uh, topic that I've written about slightly, but they're a topic that you might end up hearing about more and more over the next uh, few years. Uh, while or so, the basic idea behind a stateless client is this, right? So, I mean, as you might have seen from the diagram, sta stateless clients have something to do with a Merkle tree. Everyone bow down to Ralph Merkle again. Yeah, okay. So, 
consensus nodes do not hold the entire state. Right? So consensus nodes, so basically full nodes, miners, anyone, do not need to hold the entire state. They only need to hold the, the root hash of the state. People who want to send transactions would apply attached Merkle branches, so witnesses, basically proving the, the correctness of the specific portions of the state they want to access. So if you have a state root, and if I want to send a transaction that sends 10 coins from address A to address B, I would provide two Merkle branches that prove the existing balances of address A and address B. Then the, transac the, the transaction, the blocks would get passed around with the witness, and like that's all the information that a node needs in order to execute the block, execute every transaction in the block, and figure out what the new state root is going to be, and kind of, and what the new Merkle branches are, and what the new what the portions of the state are that got modified by that transaction. So the idea here is that we can substitute each individual instance of a discrete. So basically, uh, each individual instance of reading like, a, a storage key or an account from disk, w uh, which takes, I mean, possibly something like a millisecond, with about one kilobyte of bandwidth, assuming we optimize the Merkle tree and assuming a billion accounts. If we go up to a trillion accounts, then we'll only need SHA core 1300 bytes of bandwidth. Now, the, uh, the benefits of this are that, first of all, it makes it much easier to reshuffle validators when sharding. Basically, the idea is that if you get if you have a, if you're in a stateless client architecture and you get suddenly reassigned to a new shard, you do not have to download the state of the shard. In a stateless client paradigm, fast syncing is literally pretty much instant, um, and this is true regardless of what the state size is. Stateless clients allow us to care much less about the state size. Uh, so even if the state was you know like one petabyte, nobody really needs to store that one petabyte. And they massively increase parallelizability, uh, increase parallelizability, kind of as a side effect. So, you know, like this is one other kind of you know, secondary scalability path that I mean, like basically, it might even just make sense to do it to do it in the in the shorted universe from day one. So, regardless of kind of each individual proposal, right? The general idea is that you know like we could have ongoing development of the Ethereum protocol happen in two layers where the first layer basically involves relatively small changes, efficiency improvements, getting Casper rolled out. And then the second layer is the one where rapid development and experimentation happens. And it's the one where you know, we could get to thousands of transactions per second actually fairly quickly and on a significantly accelerated schedule if we want you know, if we wants to. So if there are applications that do not need super duper high, secu uh, high security, then you know, they can just go on layer two fairly quickly. So this gives us the benefits of basically both approaches at the same time, right? So safe and conservative layer one and all this rapid development in layer two and the ability to use layer two in order to do all of these protocol improvements that you know, developers have been uh, dreaming about the whole time without having to go through this kind of political process of getting all seven clients to agree on it and write, and write a million uh, uh, tests for it and, uh, and, and fuzz it for six months in the short term. In the longer term, even as the sharding uh, system solidifies, of course the sharding system will end up g uh, focusing greater, more and more on conservatism and security, and eventually the two will be kind of merged in some nice and clean way. But you know, look, this is something that, uh, that if we want to, can wait three or four years. So the good news is that the, well, along with the initial work of, on sharding having a uh, proceeding very quickly to the point where we are basically just inches away from having a uh, working Casper uh, proof of concept testnet in Python, we also have initial work on sharding that's being done in this repo. So you know, like we have some developers that are working on a sharding a, a c c capable client. Um, and that are starting to, to work on some of these stateless, uh, stateless client improvements, starting to experiment with some of these optimizations. And you know, the hope would be to also, you know, like if there are other client developers that wants to participate in this as well, then you know, like this is something that should happen totally openly in this sh and this is a process that, that you know, should eventually go you know, like beyond just, uh, just happening inside of one client. And you know, like basically in, you know, like in the short, in the short term, the sharding stuff would continue as kind of proof of concept in test, note, test mode. And the nice thing is that because this is not being done as a hard fork, because this is being rolled in gradually as 
this kind of loosely coupled overlay at first and tightly coupled over time. Like basically there is no sharp test net to mainnet net cutoff, right? So like the extents to which the shards are a test net and the extents to which the shards are a main net actually kind of flows fluidly from one to the other over time. So, you know, like basically this way we can get development of both scalability and a large number of other needed improvements in you know, like both, uh, both quickly and safely with respect to the existing Ethereum protocol. Thank you. Thank you.